We talked about the last time that I was here. I got into a little bit about the works and the faith. And this is a, kind of the sixth part of Say It, Do It. And it's what type of work is God talking about? We learned that Saying and faith are the same thing. We know that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And we know when we say something, that's right where it is. <laughs> you can't see it. You can't experience it. It's not something that's familiar to us, is it? To say something and to have it come to pass. That's not familiar to us. Do you know what's familiar to us? Work. Work, work, work. Get up in the morning, eight hours, ten hours, whatever, whatever our government has told us we ought to do, or whoever. And that's a very important part of it. But the saying is something we're not familiar with. And yet it's more, probably more powerful and probably the most powerful thing that you can do. God said, let there be light. God said, let there be earth. God said, let the waters divide and be oceans. God said. And he says, I want you to be like me. So why do you reckon the devil had us deceived into not focusing in on the saying part? When, when all of the Bible speaks about it, the saying. You get up in the morning, oh man, it's snowing outside. What a lousy day. We live it in the negative, don't we? Well, if anything can go wrong, it will. Everything I, everything I do and every time I try and do something that don't work, everything seems to fall apart. My uncle died at 50. I'm probably going to die at 50. Man, do you understand the power of what you're saying? But we've never dealt with it in the positive side. We always screwed around with it over there in the negative and all the wrong things and all the bad things that go on. The saying is so powerful. The saying is the faith. But remember, faith is not the doing. Faith is part of the believing, but that's not the total answer. Faith is not the only thing that we are or, or saying, and faith are not the only things that we are to be dealing with. Because it talks about, you show me your faith by what you say, I'll show you my faith by what I do. So there's a combination of things that have to be employed. It says very clearly in the whole book of James of the importance of not only saying something, but getting out and doing it. And all we've ever learned to do is, boy, you're 18 years old, you got to go get a J-O-B. Well, I know I understand that, but see, that's the world. The world gets a J-O-B. God says, I got something better than that. I want you to walk in faith. And I want you to say what you believe. And then I want you to put your hands to it. I want you to do something.
You know, I, I think of my early years, and it's 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 the struggles that I had. And of course, you know, I'm I'm like you guys. I started carpentering, and and I remember I was I was a ramrod. Can you imagine that, Mark? I mean, I was in the framing business, 1975 and six. I started, and I had guys work for me. I mean, I was a fire-eating dragon, man. I'd breathe down their neck, and I had one guy come up to me. He had a ladder in his hand. And I told him to get something done. He had a ladder in his hand. He came up to me and said, you're a crazy man. Let's threw his ladder down right in front of me. And I said, you pick that ladder up, and you get back over there and start doing what I told you to do. But can you imagine if I'd do that, didn't he? <laughs> I was... I was not gifted in the word. I didn't know what the word had to say about it. I just knew what I was taught. And I always did something. Man, when I was when I was eight years old, I, I wore my dad's lawnmower wheels out about every every month. And he said, Man, what you been doing to those lawnmower wheels? I said, Well, I'm just bone yards, you know. And he said, Well, they're worn out again. Go, well, you know what I'd do? I'd put them on my bicycle and I'd ride down the street, man. I'd be dragging that mower behind me and I'd wearing them boys out, running down the street, going as fast as I know how to go, pedaling and doing everything I could. And you know, that's better than doing nothing. But it's not as good as doing what God asks us to do. And so what is that difference? What is that thing that God has asked us to do? You know, Corey, he just wants to be a part of what we're doing. He wants to show you that you can trust him. He wants to be a part of your life. He wants to bless you. He wants to not just bless you like the world gets blessed. He wants to bless you exceedingly abundantly above anything you can ask or think. According to the power that works in you. Well, what is it your power? Is it Steve Doyle and all that monkey business I used to do and the ramrodding and stuff? I never got ahead. I remember a friend of mine worked at Ford Motor Company and we were both using the same accountant and I was absolutely embarrassed to have him turn my, my books into my accountant because I knew he'd see what my friend had and it was embarrassing how much I was making. I'm making to the negative, not to the positive. Because I spent my early years just understanding Work, 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 work. And you know what's amazing? Four years, I barely made anything from 76 to 80. And you know, when I started making money, it's when I didn't have nothing to do. Does that make any sense to you? I'm trying to teach you guys some principles. No matter how old you are, no matter how young you are, the simple principles, they're God things. They're exceedingly precious and magnificent promises that have been given to you that you can become a partaker of his divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world by lust. Because a lot of this hard work we do we're lusting for things. We can't work enough. I mean, I know guys who 12 hours a day, 12 days or seven days a week. They can't get enough. And they'll die young and their kids enjoy it all. Or they'll blow it. Because if he's working like that, he ain't teaching his kids. He's not teaching them anything. And then he wonders why his kids rebel. All that because you got to work, 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 work. The only thing that is going to have ultimate value in your life is what you do for Christ. 
And I'm not talking about doing it for him. You do it, in essence, for yourself. You, you, get, you get the blessings. You know, I remember when, when God started teaching me about Romans 13, 8. You know what that says? Owe no man anything except to love him. You know when I got my mortgage so my house paid off? When I didn't even have a mortgage. Never had a lien on a house. Never paid a mortgage payment. But I had borrowed some money for my first two houses. And the banker said, it's just yours. Go use it. Well, who what banker would tell you to do that? I was just a kid. What, what behind the ears? He gave me $30,000. $30, and by, by the time 20 months had gone by, it was paid for in the home I was living in. It was free and clear. How did I do that? Work. I was doing things. I was working. But it wasn't the way I was working when I was framing. You know, I was out of framing work. You know what happened in 1980? This whole market fell apart in Lima, Ohio. There was not a single house being built. Not right, Denny? I was sitting on two spec houses because I was working. Work, 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 go and borrow money and go and do this, go and do that. But all of a sudden, I don't have any work, don't know what to do with myself, so I just start praying. And all of a sudden, God starts talking to me. Well, isn't that interesting? And he did something there. Now, I was doing things, but it wasn't me that was blessing this thing like I was trying to bless myself when I was working my finger to the bone. But that's all gone. And I'm sitting here, and God says, stay here. I want you to work here. I'm going to show you how to be blessed. It's like, what? Am I going to work 40 hours a week, 50 hours a week, 100 hours a week? I mean, what? how are you going to do this? He said, no, no, no. Son, you got it all wrong. You got the whole focus wrong. First of all, get me involved with what you're doing. Make a commitment to me. Make a decision. Lord, this money, first 10% is yours. Be faithful to it. You know, we heard the song. Oh, God, you are faithful. He is. But I want to ask you, are you? Are you faithful? That's what the Bible says. When God comes back, is he going to find faith on the earth? Is he going to find anybody that's faithful? What's going to happen when you stand before him? Are, are you digging in and trying to find out what you're responsible for? I did, I bet did a posting on that. You'll read it tomorrow. Are you going to dig in, find out what God wants you to do, what he wants you to accomplish? Look, if you get tied in with him, I'm telling you, he will show you how to be blessed and it'll be beyond your wildest dreams. But it's going to come in a way that you don't understand and you never probably thought about it because it isn't what we were taught. It isn't what we were instructed on when we were growing up. Yeah, I know there's men out there that got a lot of land, they got a lot of this, they got a lot of that. They're, you know, they were generationally saving money and buying land and they pass it on to their kids. And that's kind of like a Russian roulette. Well, maybe sometimes you get it and sometimes you don't. Because when you do it without God's real help, you're playing Russian roulette with your life. Somewhere along the line, though, that generation falls apart because it wasn't taught properly. And that's where those men miss it. They learn how to make money, just like the Tower of Babel. But you know what? They don't know how to teach your children so that it stays in the family and they can keep it. And next thing you know, it starts falling apart and the children start falling apart and the children start running from God. Do you have any idea what's going on in this country right now? Are you blind? 
Do you know what's going on in this country right now? There's kids that are just going to college and getting money and getting big jobs, and they make money, and everything's about the money. It's not about who's responsible to raise the kids. It's not about responsibility of knowing what the Bible has to say. It's not about responsibility of what does God have to say about this thing. It's all about I'm going to make money, and I got my career, and I got to do my thing, and we'll farm the kids out. And now you got kids that are being raised by people you don't even know. And you wonder why your kids aren't right? They're screwed up? We got a generation of this coming on us like a barnstorm. I was reading an article in Colorado just last past week. 500. 500. Top corporations. In the United States, the CEOs got together. You know what they discussed? No. How we're going to survive. You know why? This happened just recently. They said, we don't know how long we're going to be able to keep our companies together. Now, I'll tell it to you from a Christian perspective. They told it from a worldly perspective. From a Christian perspective, mom and dad ain't teaching them kids nothing. They said that kids are all, he said these young kids coming out of college are living on the entitlement program. He said, we'll hire somebody and they will say, I want twice as much as that. Or we'll try and hire somebody. I want twice as much. Some of them come in and say, we want three times more. And if I don't get it from you, I'll go to the next guy. Then he said, if they do hire on, they stay a a year, maybe, maybe two. And off they go. You take all that time and all that effort and train and teach and gone. And they said, we don't know how we're going to survive. This is the world talking. This wasn't a Christian seminar. But it gives us an idea where the world is. And do you reckon there's any Christians kind of tied up in that? Totally focused on how much money they're going to make. When God says, I have a better way, just get in my book and follow it. Do what it says. Have your wife do what she's supposed to do. Have the husband do what he's supposed to do. Do to the kids what you're supposed to do. Be responsible. Just follow my book. And you have more than you could ever have doing it your way. And then everything will be lined up in an order. Your kids will be a blessing to you, not a curse. I mean, when I was raising my kids, I could go into the grocery store and woman talking about, oh, these terrible, my kids are going through the terrible twos and the gruesome threes and the horrible fours. And I'm going, what the, what's that? I wouldn't want to do any of that. I didn't have any problem with that. You know why? Because my kids were getting the value of their parents, not the value of the babysitter, not the value of the the homeschooling. Not homeschooling, but what are they? they, You farm your kids out to the daycare. Putting them in school when they're four. What? I didn't even go to kindergarten. My mom and dad says, you don't need to go to kindergarten. Too young to be trying to mess with that. You just, when you get, when, when it's first grade time, then, then you can go to first grade. So, okay. I mean, they got kids in school at four. What do you reckon they do that? They want free time. 
I gotta have my own time. Or I gotta have my career. How many times have you heard that? I've got my career. Why says I got my career? And, the, and, and, and unfortunately, what happens is they get guilt, a guilt complex and they get the feeling guilty about what's going on. And guess what they start doing? They start throwing money at the kids. And when the kids get in trouble at school, they get a lawyer because they think they're helping their kid. Kid's in trouble. And they say, we'll get a lawyer. We'll sue that teacher. Or we'll sue that person. And the kid never learns nothing. He's entitled. He gets, he gets a trophy when he loses. Oh, I don't want him to feel bad. Well, why don't you teach him to grow up? Why don't you teach him that those things happen and you know you're not going to be gifted at everything you do? Find the thing that you can be. But I thought it was interesting reading that article about these, about these men who are CEOs of the top 500 companies in the United States. That's amazing. That's our fear. We don't know how we're going to keep our companies together. We can't get the people because of the entitlement mentality of the young generation. They're never wrong because mommy and daddy told them, you're never wrong, son. That teacher's wrong. That Sunday school teacher's wrong. That neighbor kid, he's wrong. You're always right, son, daughter. They got to have the latest and greatest in clothes and, the, and all the, what do they call them, fashion clothes. Uh, they got to have the latest and greatest all the time. Designer jeans. They thought, you know, I just heard it just recently. I don't want my daughter to feel bad at school. I mean, I got to give them that stuff because I don't want to feel bad. I don't want to feel like they're out of place. Oh, you want to teach them that they need to compromise? They need to bow down to the rest of the kids? Is that what you want to teach them? That life is about the kind of clothes you wear? Let me tell you my little story. My daughter was in the sixth grade. School teacher came out to the house one day and said, uh, no, that wasn't the way it was. My daughter came home and said, mom and dad, the teacher asked me, she's in the accelerated program, Addie Lida, Dad, the teacher asked me if we could have the school party this spring at the farm where I live. And I said, I don't have a problem with that. But would you have the teacher contact us? And we'll find out what's going on. And then she did. We found out what was going on. We found the time. We needed to know what we needed to do. And we did. Let me tell you how this works. If you trust God, because that's what I did. And do it his way. You don't work the world's way. You work God's way. It's not about the sweat of your brow. That's a curse. Do you understand? You work by the sweat of your brow, you are living in a curse. That's what God told Adam and Eve. You'll spend your days working by the sweat of your brow. It's a curse to have pain in childbirth. Well, yeah, but everybody got. I'll tell you what. I had three children. Bam, bam, bam. Five minutes. I know people that have been days in labor. Do you think they're trusting God? Oh, I love God. You know, words are really cheap. It's more than the saying, but that's important. It's in the doing. That's important. Because the doing is the work. The saying is the faith.
You show me what you believe by what you say. I'll show you what I believe by what I do. They're both important. You can't leave one without the other. But anyways, this teacher came up and she said, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Dog, can I talk to you? This lady's my age. Teacher accelerated. I said, sure. So we go off. We're outside. They're outside playing. I, I got a question to ask you and your wife. And we're standing there. We said, okay. It's obvious that you guys are doing okay. Well, I'm in the middle of 50 acres, 6,500 square foot house. It's all paid for. New cars in the garage. Everything's paid for. Hadn't had a debt 20 plus years. Because I believe God, not because of anything I am. I read it. I believed it. And then I stepped out to work in it. And I said, I am not going to have a debt. And I stepped out to say, I am going to be debt free. And it's 1980. You're out of your mind, man. There ain't no houses being built. You're a builder. Why? How are you going to do that? I don't know. I'm going to trust in the Lord with all my heart. And I'm not going to lean to my understanding. So if you need that, you just go somewhere else because it ain't going to come from me. I'm just going to get the idea and I'm going to step out. I'm going to do what I say and what I believe in. That's what I'm going to do. And it has nothing to do with the sweat of my brow. That's a work. But it's not the kind he wants. It's called toil. I want to go over that a little bit. This lady says, I am impressed. She doesn't know nothing about me. She doesn't know what I owe or I don't know. She knows what I'm living in and where I have. She says, I'm impressed. But she said, man, you're such a, you're really prideful and you're really, you know, arrogant and you really got all this stuff going. Man, you're really something. And she didn't say that. She said, I'm impressed. I said, you're impressed? What, I mean, what, what are you saying? She said, you know what? Your daughter's one of my top students. Probably one of the most gifted persons in this class. But in her attitude, she's the most humble person in my whole class. All the other girls spend all their time talking about the clothes they wear, the car their parents drive, and they, how they need to impress the friends. Your daughter, she don't have designer jeans. She's got J.C. Penny jeans. You got it? I didn't do that because I knew all this. I just did it because we're not going to do anything to let my kids think they've got to do this to be okay with the crowd. Ain't going to happen. Do you know what that's called, Billy? Parenting. Do you think that's going on when all you get, you're going to do your hundred thousand a year and he's going to do his hundred thousand a year? And you got, got can't got to make this all this money. Got to have all these professions, and we got I got I got to have my way. I got to have my thing. And that very thing is the very thing these five hundred top executives in the United States are saying is screwing up this country. How many times have you heard a preacher preach this? They're afraid to. 
They don't want to lose their money. They don't want to listen to it. But it's okay. Because I'm going to teach the word of the Lord. And if that's not good for somebody, that's fine with me. Because God told me to cast all of my care on him. Because he cares for me. But instead of casting on the school teacher, or on my friends, trying to impress my friends, trying to do better than my friends do. I need to, be, I need to really look good. Some of those kids said, Mom, Dad, let me off a block before we get to school. I don't want my friends to see this car we're driving. Huh? And some of those poor parents were pouring everything they were making into those kids and their lifestyle. In the sixth grade. Do you think it's not worse now? That's 20 years ago. She was 12, she's 42. How bad do you think it is today? Do you think that's changed? Do you think that's, oh, that's just, you know, we're getting more godly. Are you kidding me, man? You are as blind as a bat. $7 trillion was given out in the last year and a half. Where is that money? Tell me who has been benefited. Tell me what person that you talked to said, man, I was really down there and this money got me up here. Can you get name anybody? That money is gone. It's like methane gas in a cow lot. It be gone. And what we're left with You think, well, you know, it's just money. And that's how most kids think. They're totally ignorant of the world, other than what mom and dad teaches them. And if they're not teaching them nothing, they're getting it from their friends. And Lord knows Facebook and whatever else they're listening to. Not a good place. This country is not in a good place. We're electing Supreme Court people who are as ungodly. That lady was asked what a woman was. She couldn't answer. She doesn't know what it is. She's got a record of letting more criminals off than any other judge. Rapists, murderers. That's all. And this is the wisdom that our leadership has decided on putting in to make decisions for our nation. What kind of leadership is that? Where in the world is this nation at? Where is the Christians at? To stand and believe for something. To stand and up for righteousness sake. Where is our Christians? Where are they at? I know there's some out there that's fighting, but men there ain't as many as should be. You know why? Most of them are like those parents. They're just going to the job and getting all the money they can and spending all their time doing that, and they go to church and everything's fine. Know nothing about the Bible. This little old hole in the wall here and little old hole in the wall, Lima, Ohio, and little old hole in the wall, Allen County, you know, I look at this and say, what in the world good am I going to do? And God said to me, that's none of your business. I said, got it.
Ain't none of my business. You know what my business is? To do what he asked me to do. You know why? Because I learned for 35, 45 years that no matter how simple it looks, how insignificant it looks, if I just do what he says, he will put your feet on the high ground. That's, so that's what I'm doing here. I talked to you guys this morning. What was the main theme of what I had to say? I was learning from it. Patience. Let patience have its perfect work. Nothing's going to happen overnight. Just keep going. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't you think that the, your, the work is that you're doing is get, you're making it blessed. Don't you get there, though. You constantly remember, God will bless the work of your hands. Don't you let God out of the equation. That's what he's talking about in this, in this message here of faith, which is saying, and works, which is doing, equals blessing. Say it, do it. Works is a Greek word called ergon. Means deeds, deed, work, wrought. 152 times in the King James it's used as work. 22 times deed and one time in doing. And the word wrought, which is ergon, and just doesn't get translated that way, Difficult to get all these words in one little verse. That's why I recommend you guys, as much as with, as you can, keep an amplified version of the Bible with you. I don't say you need to read in that. Okay, King James, NIV, New American Standard, they're all good. Okay, I've read in all of them. Been blessed in all of them. Got revelation from God in all of them. But the Amplified will take several words in the translating of a word, and it gives you a little height, heightened understanding of what's being said. Okay, I won't say more about that. The word wrought means activity involving mental or physical effort done in order to achieve a purpose or a result. You guys put your hands to it, you sell a project. You put your hands to that, you start putting it together. You keep your hands on it, you finish it up. You keep your hands on it, you send an invoice and you get a paycheck. You keep your hands on it, and you are frugal with the money you have. You know why you're frugal with the money you have? Because you respect what you earn. That's why he gave us Romans 13.8. He doesn't want you to be in debt. You know why? Because everything you go borrow doesn't mean nothing to you, and you go borrow and buy things you shouldn't be buying. It's really easy. Do you know the number one financial problem in America? Consumer debt. You know why consumer debt's a problem? Talk to me. Why is consumer debt a problem? Because everything you buy as a consumer doesn't have any value to you. You know what? You can't deduct it from your wages. It takes how much? How much money does it take? I did a teaching on this to a whole bunch of inner city kids. Boy, did they get flipped out! I'm not going through that. How much money does it take to buy a twenty thousand dollar car? More than 20? Well, the first thing you got to do, 
you got to pay 10%, 8% sales tax. So now it's not 20 anymore. It's 21,600. That money that you're using, how much income tax did you pay on it? 30%? So now it's not 21,600. You got to add 30% more to it. So now it's $28,000. But if you borrow the money, 28000 But if you borrow it, it's even worse because now you got to pay interest on it. Okay. And a house should pay more than double. You see how it goes? And you know what most people think when they go out, they're out going through the mall. Yeah, I make, I make $30 an hour. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm making about $1,200 a week. We can afford that. That's where they all get in trouble. We can afford it. Let's put it on the credit card. Now we're going to pay 20% 20, 20 on it. Now, what does that add to this thing? Do you understand? You don't get tax deductions on the interest that you're paying. So if, if, if that 20000 is now 28000 or 29000 just from sales tax and income tax, now you're going to throw 23% on top of that. You're going to pay 23% on sales tax and income tax. Has anybody ever taught you guys any of that stuff? Did you get any of that in school? Do you think they teach any of that in school? You know what they're teaching in school now? You need to be transgender. We need to be open-minded. We need to start teaching transgenderism so that we are all thinking right and we're all got the right things. And, and you never know what you are. You, you, I, know, I know that it looks like you're a boy. But you know what? You might want to be a girl. You know what? Because you're smarter than God. Aren't you? That's what they're saying. Wouldn't it be better if they taught about a little about financing and all the problems we're having? Instead, they want to talk about transgender. How stupid is it? That's where we're headed, guys. Well, I'm sorry. I'm wrong. We're not headed there. We are there. We are in the middle of it. Do you think there's a reason for Christians to start rising up? What are they going to do different? Obviously, what they've done for the last 50 years has not worked. Don't you think they ought to wake up and look in the mirror and say, yeah, what, what's, what do they say a de definition of insanity is? Go ahead, Billy. Expecting different results. That's they say is insanity. So what are they going to do that's different? They think they just keep doing what they're doing because it's okay. You know why? Because it's comfortable. They're in habit. Like going to a church is you're not learning nothing. You just keep doing it. You're in habit. It's called a familiar spirit. It's driven by demons. Demons, demons, are behind all of it. And the sad part of this, you don't even hear that in the churches. When's the last time you hear one of those famous big church guys talking about demons? It's always about warm and fuzzy. Oh, you need to believe the best and need to think the best. And, you know, everything's going to be all right because you're just thinking the best. And so, so all, all, basically, it's all soul, it's all soulish. There's nothing spiritual about it other than God wants us to think on lovely things, no question, but God wants us to grow up in the spirit world because that's where the power is. The soul has no power. You know, Norman Vincent Peale, who was Donald Trump's pastor, wrote a book called The Power of Positive Thinking. Probably not a bad book if you dig, dig into it and find out the proper scriptures to apply to it, but, they, but it's all about their... their Intellect and how they see things. Dr. Robert Schuler in California, Crystal Cathedral, same thing. It's all about thinking positive. Always be thinking positive. And there's some of that in here. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. 
Whatsoever things are lovely and honest and just and pure and true and of a good report, if there's anything virtuous and anything worthy of praise, think on these things. Those are wonderful things, right? But they leave out the spirit. That's exactly what I'm talking to you about. You can go to work every day, keep working and working and going to church and keep going, but not have God blessing anything that you're doing. It's all about whatever General Motors can do for you. Just keep working more and more and more hours and just, you know, can't make enough. Nothing about God. Nothing about giving God. Nothing about God owns my business. God owns my money. God owns my life. Nothing about that. It's just strictly soulish. An intellectual approach to the things of God. And there's no power in that. I know he says power positive thing. And one of the great written men, they sold a lot of copies. You think there's a spiritual side to that? Do you think he talked about the power of God? Do you think he talked about laying hands on the sick? That isn't power positive thinking. If that's what you think it is and lay hands on somebody and they get healed, that's not power positive thinking. That's power of the Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus said when he said, don't go do nothing until you are due with power from on high. He didn't say, don't go do nothing until you get your brain educated. That's not what he said. He's talking about the spirit. This is what I'm trying to teach you guys. Because we want to be different. Not be different to be different. That doesn't do nothing. We want to be different because we say, okay, God, this is what you said. This is what I believe in. It's over. I'm done with it. That's where I'm at. That's how I've lived my life for 45 years. Every single day. And I know it works. No, I don't have Donald Trump's wealth. But God told me in 1983, I don't want you to go to Atlanta and Dallas, or I might have. Probably would. But he said, I don't want you to do that, son. I want you to stay here. And I want to teach you how to be blessed in a son's court's land. I'm going to show you how to do that. Are you willing to do that? Well, I don't have a job. Hardly have any money. Now, he did pay my house off and he paid my cars off. I do have that, but I don't have, I don't have any work. I got three little babies at home. That's what God told me to do. You know what? If I went around telling people about that, which I didn't, don't do, and you guys all know that. You've got to learn to keep your mouth shut, keep your chin in the wind and your eye in the skyline and keep moving. And don't look back because that's nothing back there. You can only fix today. You can't fix tomorrow and you can't fix yesterday. Don't look back. There's nothing back there that's of any value to you. As a teacher and an anointed teacher, I look back to teach you what to do and not to do in sense of I can show you what you can do to avoid a lot of heartache and a lot of struggle. I'm not ashamed to tell you, and I've told you some of the stories. I'm not ashamed to tell you those things because I know in my heart God allowed me, and he didn't cause it to happen. I did, but he's seen it. He knew what was going on in my life, and he's seen it, and he knew I was going to stand even though I miss it. And I, I, and I learned how to get myself out of it. Is that right, Mark? I told you guys that little story this morning. My little Harley Davidson story. God will get you out of it. What did I do to get that? What did I do to earn that? I didn't do anything. Because I was saving the money a little bit at a time, a little bit little. So that was God. So what I was doing wasn't me. It was God. I was walking in. I was using his principle. Understand? Money gained little by little makes it grow. So I was saving that. I was saving that money a little bit over the course of six years. And at the end of six years, I had enough to buy the Harley. Right? That wasn't me. That was God. He told me this money gained little by little makes it grow. 
That was him. I know I was doing it, but that's what he tells me to do. You got to be a doer of the word, not a hearer only. You got it? He'll teach you those things out of his book. And they will work because there's life to that book. There's more life in that book than there is in this world. Because that book controls the whole universe. All we're seeing is the earth. And let me tell you, 99% of the people have seen very little of that. And that book is the answer to the simple things of life that has so much power in it. Nobody can stop it. Man, I wish I could tell all the stories all at once. Oh, I can't. But I'm telling you, the simplicity of a word is where there's power. It says, unless you humble yourself as a little child, you will never see the kingdom of God. Next time you get in front of your kids or your grandkids, you check that out. They believe anything you tell them. Do you reckon God was getting the point across to us? I'm your father. And even though you're 60 years old or 70 years old or 30 years old or 50, you're still a little baby in my eyes. Because I don't have an age. Can you... Com- can you compare can you compare one dollar can you compare one dollar to infinity? Can anybody do that? My brother has a doctor's degree in mathematics. He can't do it. That means he's taken every math course ever offered in the earth. And he writes stuff about it. And he can't relate to a dollar and infinity. That's why you can't relate to God through your brain. Because it will never make sense to you. Because he's not comparable. You can compare it to nothing. He's everything. Anything. All. Always. Never leave you or forsake you. Did you say never? Let's bring the Bible into that. Never. Uh, huh, what? You that in your brain? Is that how you felt today? Is that how you felt when you're walking around? He said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. But you got to keep your eyes on me, not on the world. Because the minute you get your eyes on the world and what's going on out there, I can't help you. You know what? He couldn't help Adam and Eve. They took their eyes off of him and put it on the tree of good and evil. Do you know how many trees there was in the garden? Millions. You know how many of them have fruit on them? Most. Eat it, live on it. But we don't want all that. We want that one. But they didn't come up with that. The enemy did. So who's talking to you? Who's telling you you can't? Who's telling you you're never going to make it? Who's telling you you're never never going to pay your debts off? Who's telling you you're behind the eight ball and you're never going to get ahead? Who's telling you that? Who's telling you you're not going to win? Who's telling you that 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 project that I'm supposed to do is never going to happen because it's impossible? I don't know how it's ever going to work. Who's telling you that? Who are you listening to? If you're not into the word, you're listening to the world. 
Because a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. You can't have both. And if you're not in that, you're in the world. You can't, you're not both. You can't be both. Because if you're not in there, you're getting what it says. You're getting something. Period. You're getting something. You don't live in a vacuum. And your brain isn't on neutral. That transmission is in gear. Do you understand? I don't know if it's in reverse or if it's drive, but I'm telling you, it's in gear. If you did that today, your, your brain's in gear. Which way are you going? What are you going to choose to do? You're going to choose to believe this? Or are you going to choose to believe everything around you and all the things you hear? I don't spend any time reading that stuff. I just hear, I just hear it because I have to hear it. You just hear it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, I'm not going to go hear it. It just, there are people over there talking and I'm sitting here and also I'm hearing it. I like to do this and walk away, but I've already heard more than I should. But if you're in this, this drives that away. Renew your mind and prove that which is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You let God do the rest. He'll do it. He'll take you places you never dreamed of. I've been there. I got the t-shirt. I got a few of them. And everything I'm telling you, I've lived. I've never told you anything I wasn't already, that I haven't lived. And some of you know me most of my life. It works. But it's, it's up to you. It's not up to God. It's not up to me. God's already established his will. See, the book of the Bible is the will of God. They call it, well, it's the New Testament and it's the Old Testament. And what is Testament? You guys know what that means? What is a testimony? A testament of your life. It's a testimony of your life. This is the testimony of God's life. How he created you. What he wants you to do. What you can do. What you can't do. What you shouldn't do. Why you need to believe him. I come that you'd have life and have it more abundantly. What? What? That's what he said. Do you believe it? You know, I said, say it and do it. If you believe it, you'll do it. So don't come and tell me I don't have time because you're telling me that you're not going to do it. And if you're not going to do it, then you're not living with what he asked you to do. I want you to say it and then I want you to do it. I want you to say it and I want you to do it. Don't just try and do it because next thing you know, you're going to be doing it on your own and it's all about you. Don't go there. Stay with both principles. Stay with God in the middle of the thing. Stay with him. Stay with him. Do you know how hard it was to think I heard from God when I heard this voice and I got three little babies over here and they're all needing food and they're needing clothing and they're needing shelter and 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 he says, I don't, and I don't have a job, J O B, not a single house, five years. Five years. Had two spec houses in 1979. Five years.
Go over and have open house every weekend. Five years. Drag my mower over there on the other side of town and in Laurel Oaks. Five years. Get phone calls from people and they say, hey, your front door's open and we're in a snowstorm. I can't even see the little drive out of my driveway. And go over there and I got three foot of snow in the whole house. Because a realtor went in there and left the door open. Five years. Everything around me looked like it was sinking sand. But you know what I did in the mornings? I got up in the morning and I got my Bible out and I read it. I didn't get up and say, God, why are you doing this to me? I mean, why is this happening? Oh my gosh, don't you care? Don't you love me? Don't you, what, what is all this mess going on? My God, why don't you step in and do something? I never did that. And I've never done it. Not one time. Because I stay in this book and I can say, I trust it. Just look around you, man. This whole earth is sinking sand. Everybody you know has gone through it, if they're not in that. Their life is in a turmoil. They're failing. And they think they're okay. Because they got a nice car and they eat at McDonald's every day. Got all the food I need. Their flesh is totally satisfied all the time. What are you going to do if that doesn't happen anymore? What are you going to do if we go into this electric thing and the Russians shoot a missile up in the outer space and the atomic bomb blows out our electrical grid and, and, and we've got a government that pushes all the driving electric cars? You can't even drive to the store. What are you going to do then? Come out to my place. I'll be okay. Guaranteed. I'm going to be okay. But I don't know how. But I've already lived that way. For 45 years. I don't know how God's going to do it, but that's none of my business. All he asked me to do is trust in the Lord with all your heart. Did he say some of it? Did he say, well, you know, you got to have an education and you got to trust in the professors and you got to trust in some of the, you know, college curriculum and some of the stuff. Did he say that? No, he said, trust in the Lord, the creator of heaven and earth. That's what I said I'm going to do. And when he asked me to stay here, not a problem. Never complained. Five years I waited for those spec houses to sell. I didn't have enough money to pay the interest. But, and I don't have the time to tell you the miracles that God performed. Because it's Time's up. I'm not mad at anybody. I don't despise anybody. I have a love for you guys. I want to see. God, grow up inside of you. I don't care how many years you've been going to church. I don't give a flipping, ripping, dipping about how long you've gone to church. It means zero to me. And what you've heard in the church probably is zero. Just because they have lots of people going there don't mean a flipping thing. I'm talking about you and God having a relationship. So that God can use you to accomplish the things that he put in your life the day he conceived about you 6,000 years ago. He's seen you 6,000 years ago. Do you know that? And he put a plan in you. He said, I got a plan for him. Let me tell you, you're, you're in this earth at such a time as this. This is the end times, and God put you here for a reason. It's really important because you know what? You could have been born in 1850 out in the West somewhere where all they had is Indians running around shooting arrows at you. But you were born 
right now for such a time as this. And I venture to say, <coughs> the, the, the huge percentage of people are going to go to the grave and never accomplish a thing. Never get anything done that God had planned for you. And I know it's hard in your brain to figure that out. That's why I tell you to go to the book. Because it's the book that tells me that. Genesis chapter 6, 26. Genesis 1. God has a plan for you. He wrote a book about you. It's really exciting. You may be accomplished. You may have you, you've accomplished some of it. Maybe five or ten percent. Maybe 25% if you really are spiritual. But the bottom line is, he's got a plan. We're working it, aren't we, Mark? Colin, Wayne, we're working it. We got plans here to do things. Maybe we're just nobody. But God doesn't deal with us according to how many people we have here or Compare me with some mega church somewhere. He's not comparing me that. He's saying what's important is what you do with what you have. Are you being faithful to what you have? And if you will be faithful to what you have, God says, I will see to it you have more. How does that happen? The saying and the doing. You get up, you have an idea, you say, that's what I'm going to do, I'm going to go do this, and then you go. You guys know the story in the New Testament. Well, one guy had this poor guy come to him and he said, oh, man, you're really in bad shape. He said, I feel so bad. I'm going to do all kinds of things for you. And then he walks away and doesn't do anything. And then another guy comes along. The guy says, look, get out of my hair. I don't want you around here. Get out of my way. But in the end, he takes the man to the, to the restaurant and the hotel, tells him whatever this man needs, you put it on my account. Now, which one is the one that God's going to be pleased with? The one said, no, nah, I don't want to bother with you. The one that says, oh, yeah, I'm going to bless you and everything's going to be good. It's going to be the one. They both said it, but only one did it. Got it? Only one did it. Father, I thank you and praise you for this word that the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened, that we would see and understand the hope of the glory that's in us, that we will see the power that's working in us, that we'll see that, Lord, is about you and not about how hard we work and what we do. It's, it's, a, it's trusting in you. It's trusting in what you say. It's knowing that you empower our hands. You power the work of our hands. You empower the tongue. You empower every aspect of our life. We surrender ourselves, Father, to you. We surrender ourselves to the kingdom of God. We surrender ourselves to your love. We surrender ourselves. We give you our sin and our failures and our shortcomings, sir, and we're receiving your blessing and your goodness and your forgiveness. We're redeemed. We give you all of our negative and we're going to take all your positive. We know that there's nothing good in us, not in our flesh. We know that. But we're not living that way anymore. We're going to live by the Spirit. We're not going to live by the flesh. We're going to not live by how we feel and how we taste and how we touch and how we smell and how we hear. We're not going to live that way. We're going to live on what we know, read, meditate, 
and understand in your book. That's the spirit. For the word of God is spirit in its truth and its life. We live by the spirit. And we give it praise and thanksgiving, sir, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen.